So hello again. We are back here and it's uh, part two of, of tonight or part three of Great Escape Week. And um, it's fa family members this time. So we're, we've done the heavy lifting with the other shows. We're not here to go through the complete history of Stag Love 3 and Escape. We're just here to have a nice chat with people whose fathers, uncles, whatever, were in the camp there and talk about how they feel about the Great Escape, how they think about uh, the legacy 77 years on, what they think about camp life, some memoirs, some anecdotes. And we'll go from there. Ted Barris will be joining us at some point. He's not quite in the in the meeting room yet. I, I, I'll, I'll check with him. But um, here's everybody that we have so far. So uh, we'll, some of the names you'll recognize, folks, because you've heard them talked about, or their fathers talked about by Ted in the previous show. But we're going to bring in the two new guests first. And joining us from the USA first, Cindy Avery. So your father, um, I'll put his photo up, was... Um, in style of three. So if you'd like to share with us a little bit of his story and, and how you came to research it, and then we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my father was in Stalag Loop 3 from May 1944 until the long March in January of 45. Um, growing up, I didn't really know much about his experience, except he would relate it to the Great Escape movie after that came out when I was probably 10. And so growing up, I only knew that he was with the, um, that he was a B-24 pilot, that he was shot down, and that he was in Stalag Luft Three, And that was the extent of my knowledge. And um, I don't know, maybe six or seven years before he died, I had uh, an opportunity to see a television special about the 8th Air Force, and I was positive that one of the men in the broadcast was my father. So I called him, he was in Florida at the time, and said, Dad, were you ever in the 8th Air Force? And that was the key to make him want to tell his story. And his he, he wrote it, but it was... Um, I don't know, 20, 25 pages. He felt that was all that needed to be said. And when he died, I inherited a box, which I call my treasure trove. And in the box were a very thick file of his service record, all kinds of information and notes about his experience in World and Stalag Luft Three, what had happened to his the rest of his crew, he wrote about the march, he wrote about the conditions at Mooseburg, and it was all in this box, photos, everything. And so I spent um, the first year of my retirement trying to organize it in piles <laughs> all around my living room and dining room table, and it was everywhere. And then when COVID hit, I really buckled down and began to write the story in a way that I felt was um, easy to read and that people would be interested in and published it actually on his birthday in this past October. And I'm, I'm very proud of what I did, but more so I was excited about the connections that I was able to make finding some of his crew members, children, um, connecting with people like you who've given me lots of information and insight that just beefed up dad's story. And I, I learned about different websites I could go to and, and so on. But I think what I take away from his experience in Stalag Luft Three is similar to, um, everyone else's all he talked about was being cold and being hungry and <laughs> how much time they spent trying to keep warm find wood uh spread newspapers on the bed to uh have another layer of insulation and the um life-saving packages that they got from the red cross and um it was amazing to me that he went through all of that and never shared it with anyone except my mother who never shared it with anyone <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a real learning experience for me and i i gained 
more love for him than you can even imagine, but also such respect for all the men that had gone through that. And um, I'm just, I, I don't know where else to go with that other than to say it was just an amazing experience to be able to live it through his words and his eyes and then to be able to share that with well, the world. I saw again. lots of nodding when you said that they didn't want to talk about it and no one knew about it because that is whether we're talking about POWs or Normandy veterans or wherever it would be. So many of these people came back and just shut the hell up about it for years and years and years and never told a soul, dealing with whatever it was they were dealing with and all those different emotions of, of, of sometimes guilt, sometimes um, you know survivor's guilt, whatever it would be. So that understanding of, of um, not, not having it, the family member tell you about it is something that any many people watching this will identify with. The right. second thing I wanted that is important to, to, to emphasize that you brought up is that for those in Stagler 3, life went on after the great escape, which occurred 77 years ago this week. There was a brutal winter to get through. Let's not forget, folks, the winter of 44, 45 is the coldest winter in the, in, in the 20th century. And that's when the uh, the lack of bed water wooden wooden paneling on the hut started to come back in to bite them then because all that wood they'd stripped off the reinforced tunnels was never replaced so now they're realizing they're cold they've used up firework they've saved rations and they've now got to go for winter winter and of course the forced march that happened in 1945 and that's the th importance i'm going to bring ted in a minute that the great escape story is an important vital I'm going to use the word exciting story of prisoner of war camp life with a, with a terrible tragic aftermath, but POW uh, uh, camp life went on before the escape and it went on after the escape. So, so Ted, when you were doing your, your research for your book, were people, were veterans surprised when you wanted to know about events after the escape? Because so often the book just stops with the escape, but of course there's another year to go. So what's your feelings about that? Well, obviously the dead can't speak, so anything that might have been contributed to that post-escape uh, environment is missing. So you have to depend on what the men wrote down. Um, I think of Johnny Caldwell, the chicken farmer I mentioned from BC, um, and I'm sure that, that uh, Barry can talk about some of the notes that uh, were evident in his dad's memoirs. Um, it, some of that stuff stayed hidden for a long time, but ultimately revealed the hate, I call, that chapter is called The Hate Campaign, in which clearly uh, the, what was a fairly uh, peaceable, at least inside the wire, experience and existence uh, took a turn for the worst uh, after that moment of the killings. Um, and with the Gestapo more present and the SS more, more present than they ever had been, uh, the, the uh, anger, uh, it just took us a, a second, a split second for it to, to emerge. Remember too, um, as George Sweener indicated to me at some length, they built a fourth tunnel. They built Tunnel George just uh, in anticipation of should it, things really turn for the worst, they had one last attempted uh, escape route out uh, to use as a means of defending themselves. And they even had some weapons there. George talked about teaching the guys who were left commando techniques, self-defense techniques, should they need them without weapons. And that's very important. I mean, to, to, to acknowledge that there, there's a whole survival out there. But I'm going to bring in Stuart Green now because Stuart um, responded to my uh, post on a Facebook group and your father was in the camp. Um, and you know, you're in Britain. So, um, and your father was, was shot down with Des Plunkett. And anybody who's read anything about the, the Great Escape knows about Des Plunkett. So um, there's your father there, Alan William Green on the left. And you sent me the photo today. Thank you very much. And there's Des Plunkett there. So, you know, you, you're another one who grew up in a household with someone who was in Stag of Three. What was your experience initially growing up uh, with the understanding that there's a, uh, someone in your family with a connection to this massive part of history? That's, uh, sadly for me, um, my, my father died when he, was, when he was quite young. He died on his 56th birthday, 45 years ago this year, when I was young. And we shared an interest in aviation. And I, I was aware that, um, that, he was a, that he'd been a prisoner of war, but I was only, I was only 12 when he passed away. And I, I perhaps had no you know, regret not, uh, not talking to him more about it. But uh, he made the odd comment. Um, and anyway, um, Many, many years later, um, this had been sort of eating away at me. 
And so in 2011, I decided to, to start doing some research into his life, uh, his POW life and his wartime life. And uh, this started with uh, a trip to Stalag of Three uh, in, in June 2011. It just so happened that three of uh, Charles Clark, um, Alf, Alfie Fripp, and um, another gentleman were there making a documentary. So I was able to talk to them um, about their experiences whilst I was there. I was able to find Des Plunkett's name on the uh, on, on the on the tunnel uh, where uh, all the names of all the seventy six of the Nathan tunnel that were given. Um, so that um, started my quest for finding out information, and it's quite been an interesting voyage of discovery for me to to try and fill a lot of gaps. And then in um, November of uh, two thousand eleven, I made a chance discovery um, with regard to uh, the existence of a memorial on the site where Des and my dad were shot down in June 1942. Um, and um, I knew nothing about this memorial. Um, and at the time, I was due to give a talk in my local village hall about my trip to Stalag of Three. And all of a sudden, I had the opportunity to get some more information. So I go off to, uh, to Holland for the day with my two sons and a neighbor who had an interest and um we, we turn up at uh, this uh we, we met by our um by our contact he takes us to um the local town hall first and um which i wasn't expecting so i walk into the room with my sons and our friend and there's a civic reception waiting for us in the room 25 people the local mayor local press it turned out we were turned out we we're the first people the first relatives of the crew this sterling there was a crew of eight on this of this sterling this particular day uh, three of the three of the crew died uh, the youngest of whom was only 19 um, and uh, my father was a navigator who was a navigator and the second pilot des managed to get out along with um, three others the captain uh, squadron leader ashworth he died in the crash as did the 19 year old the other person to bail out, his, he, his, his parachute failed to open and he was found uh, quite close to the crash site. Anyway, um, this, we had this reception and I discovered that my father was separated from the remaining crew members and he, held, he, he hid in a, in a copse for, for a day or two. He was helped by these Dutch farmers. And it turns out that this, this Dutch farming family had put my dad on a tram uh, to try and get to Amsterdam to meet the resistance, but unfortunately he was intercepted. And uh, he was then taken prisoner and ended up at Dulaglov. But um, after my father's capture, they, they found his parachute, which they used to make a wedding dress out of, out of which is very common apparently, um, mm -hmm. lack of silk. And, but they kept the parachute harness in the family. The next minute, this guy stands up and he couldn't speak any English because it was a very rural, it's a very rural community. Uh, north of Amsterdam, about an hour north of Amsterdam, and um, the, um, the the son of the farmer stood up, and he couldn't speak English. He, was, he could only speak Dutch. And a local historian was translating, and uh, the next minute, this guy produces pieces of my father's parachutes, and seventy odd years later, and uh, well, it's not quite seventy years later. Anyway. I couldn't speak. <laughs> I, I was. I, it was like an emotional sledgehammer. And and uh, once I once I sort of composed myself, I was then asked to talk about my father. And uh, then we, we went off to the to the memorial uh, itself and met more witnesses. And also, sorry, I forgot to say that there was an elderly lady witness uh, still living in the same house that she'd lived in uh, as a young girl when this Sterling bomber crashed in the back garden. Of her. Um, and uh, still, so we met her, and then we met more witnesses. And then we eventually went off to the to see the, the cemetery where the three crew died buried. It's interesting that the, 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 the captain, Squadron Leader Ashworth, was actually forty. He was quite old. And in the in the um, cemetery where um, uh, where the, the, the two hundred the two hundred eighty five crew based uh, buried at the cemetery in Bergen, Holland, um, he was the old he's the oldest casualty there. So, but since that time, I've been. Um, so, so it, it just led to a voyage of discovery, and uh, and and uh, joined various Facebook groups, and and I've managed to 
glean an awful lot from my, I've got a lot of letters my father wrote as prisoner of war uh, in Stalingrad through. So he was there from uh, um, beginning of July 42 to January 45, and like the others, uh, was involved in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the march. I don't know, he was in the East Compound, so I don't know the level of his involvement in uh, the Great Escape, but what I do know, he obviously was for he knew Des Plunkett, um, but he also knew Jens Muller because I've got Jens Muller's address in his uh, in my father's uh, POW wow. diary, and he also knew Charles Hall that Charles was shot, one of the fifty shot. Well, this, so, this I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you now, Stuart, but this, this is the thing that there's the story that we know is like a spider's web of more stories because everybody yeah. was part of an air crew who had more crew, who went to different camps, people survived, people were captured, they were taking a different camp. And this this is the, the thing that, the, like so often, the event of an escape has actually led to people getting together and forging relationships and connections that go way beyond that to something much wider and much more important and telling a much bigger story. Because the, the, as you said yourself, Ted, in the earlier show, the, you know, the story of the Kriegies doesn't get told enough. Just that day-to-day -day existence, particularly, I know most of you, we know, our fa fathers here were, were, were officers, but the other ranks camps weren't quite as classy. The, the, the struggle with food and things like that was an ongoing thing. And we're highlighting all the, um, the situations faced by POWs, not just the issue of an escape. But um, I'm aware we've got Chris Pengley keeps going in and out because his internet internet connection is 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 iffy. But um, to all of you here, do you you all? There's this wider story that I think is so fascinating that that, that perhaps is underexplored. That every all the focus is on the people involved in in the actual tunnel itself. But anyway, I want to bring in Brian Fluddy here because as a kid growing up, your father was a bit of a legend to me because he came up in all those photos. <laughs> of the Great Escape movie, because like most people, I don't mind admitting it. My entry to the, Paul, the Great Escape was the movie first. Then I got the Paul Brickhill book, and then I went from there. And your father's photo just kept turning up in all those in all those amazing photos. And I don't, I'm going to put them up on screen now. So, when did you find out, um, Brian, that your father had such an incredibly important role in in Star Wars Three and the and the creation of the tunnels? Well, I, I knew about The Great Escape um, from birth, it seems, um, just because uh, we lived in England briefly after the war with mostly Kriegis that had managed to get my father a job. And then we came back to Toronto and um, my father was part of the um, XPOW, the Canadian uh, POW Association. So many of the family friends were uh, Kriegi families. Um, so we all sort of knew about it. Um, and But like most people, um, you know, my father didn't talk about it very much. Uh, uh, you know, I heard things from my mother about the more difficult times. Um, but uh, it wasn't until the movie came out, like so many of you, that uh, there was a big splash then. Of course, all my school friends now knew about it. And um, it became much more part of my life and uh, um, also my father's life because that generated a lot of interest uh, um, around us and uh, around uh, Canada for sure and, and, and um, the cinematic world. And um, that led to my father having more speaking engagements about it and things like that. So it's certainly at some level or another, it's always been around me. Both my godfathers were prisoners of war and uh, my father's, you know, my, my brother's godfather, Crump Cramsey, he was a prisoner of war, you know, so um, it, uh, it was certainly ingrained in the family. Um, and of course, my, the fact that my father worked on the movie um, uh, gave me a lot of street cred at the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine it would earn you a bit of um, a bit of extra um, uh, respect and what have you from your f fellow school kids and what have you. So, who wants to go in next? We've got you know for those who watched the earlier show, you're recognising all the names here. So um, let's let's bring in Vicky next because um, we're waiting there patiently. So Vicky, you know Ted talked about your father um, and his role in in the uh, the escape. What was your introduction to history? Did 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 you know were you would you grow up in a house of knowing everything about the escape or did it did it come slowly and surely over the years? My story is very much like Cindy's. Uh, there was no talk about it. The only thing I knew about it was um, when we watched the movie, 
I watched it with him once when I was very young and I don't remember too much what he said. I do recall he was making a lot of comments throughout it. Um, and at one point, uh, uh, he pointed to the TV uh, and he was pointing at um, uh, Roger Bartlett or Roger Bushel and he said, I taught Danish to that guy. <laughs> and uh, so that that's always stood out in my mind, but he didn't say anything about uh, the executions or, uh, you know, there was nothing else. And then after that, he never spoke about it. Um, the only stories he ever told me were, uh, which is incredible. Um, he had uh, appendicitis in October, 1943. And I only know this because it's on his uh, POW card. And uh, anyway, he had to have a surgery and he told me that uh, um, he could feel them cutting. So I just assumed that he, all he had was uh, maybe a bit of freezing, no general anesthetic. And he told me that during the surgery, there was a dog circling the table and they took out his appendix and threw it to the floor and the dog ate it. Wow. <laughs> and he, he sort of told me that story. The look on his face was sort of like, uh, uh, amusement, but bewildered. He couldn't believe that it happened, but it was funny at the same time. Um, you know, there was no uh, horror stories that he told me. Um, really, there was nothing else. My uh, mother didn't talk about it. Um, it was sort of while I was growing up, it was um, an un unspoken um and maybe just my assumption, but just don't talk about the war, don't talk about the escape. Um, my dad uh, suffered from PTSD and I certainly didn't want to provoke any, uh, uh, you know, outbursts or any problems that he may have as a result of talking about it. Um, so I just let it go. And I grew up assuming that because he didn't talk about it and, nobody else did that it really wasn't all that important and that's the wow, way wow. he carried on with his life um you know the the city we lived in uh nobody knew that he was involved uh he he was um a penguin he told me he was a penguin and he told me you know what he did um he also um relayed a story at some point about how um, there was a security breach and he was um, bringing the, the bags of sand into the room where they were dispersing it. And he said that a, uh, a guard walked by the window. Um, someone hadn't alerted them to the fact that there was somebody walking by. Um, really nothing else uh, he didn't talk about the uh, forced march afterwards. Um, this was all sort of uh, unknown territory. And I didn't really learn about all of this until after he died. Um, and my aunt uh, was about six months after his death. And she asked me about his letters. and. I didn't know anything about them. I had never seen the letters. I had never seen any pictures. I hadn't seen any documents. So I said to her, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, well, you know, your brother brought them back. And uh, so when I asked him, he said, yeah, I know where they are. And he got them all to me. And, and uh, I eventually went through everything. And, and there were letters from when he was training, letters from POW camp. Um, there were pictures, photographs I'd never seen, um, documents that he had sent away for. Uh, it, it was um, a real eye-opener for me, um, mm -hmm. reading all the letters. And um, I eventually uh, met up with Ted uh, because our local newspaper had done an article about me finding these letters and someone that knew Ted told him about it. And then I got a call from Ted wanting to know if I'd be interested in uh, participating with the book. Wow. Um, 
So I, I, I want to thank you. That was amazing. I want to bring in some other people as well. There's Barry and Chris we haven't spoken to yet. So Barry, um, I'm just going to mute you to, um, Ricky there because we're hearing your uh, microphone. So Barry, how much of of what you're hearing from other people here do you recognise with regards to your father? This this you know not talking about it. And maybe a second question leading on from that: How much perhaps did the fact that fifty of the men get murdered mean that? That's one of the reasons these guys didn't talk about it after the war, because there was this this tragic element. But but you know what what's your experience growing up? Uh, well, I I like Brian. I, I grew up with it. Um, we uh, we certainly um, talked about it often. My dad thankfully didn't seem to have uh, um, I mean, stuff to look inside. The the trauma didn't show itself very often. Um, other than into your question, other than the anger that would come out, uh, it was interesting. He would talk about the friends that he made, and and I was absolutely blessed, my sisters and I, um, because we grew up attending the POW Association and Air Crew uh, lunches and such. So, uh, I mean, I, I had some of the best role models in the world to grow up around, and not only that, uh, but some of the best stories to hear. And it was interesting because you could, uh, in hindsight now, looking back, you can see where they were uh, sensitive or, or raw points, um, but you also recognize the strength of, of these men and how they, <clears throat> excuse me, took a, a horrific experience and bonded and connected and, um, you know, the, the, and pulled it together and managed to contribute and carry on. Um, it, uh, I, I was very fortunate because we, as as the story came out more and more uh, on the in the Western Canadian side, uh, my father ended up doing a fair bit of media around it. We often joked within the family he wasn't this bad, but it was fun to give him a hard time that his role expanded as uh, as people were passing away from old age. Um, but uh, of course, and and as Ted and many have said, he was one of many scroungers out there. He he may have played an important role, but he was one of many, and uh, and he was quick to say that. So. Um, that and I, I grew up immediately uh, having access to his logbook uh, and and the materials and such. So, from an education point of view, and, a, and again, I'm fortunate. Both of my kids grew up around that, and so they're quite active in uh, history and such because of the connection with my dad. Yeah, and and you know that 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 idea of there being some things you can talk about and some things that aren't talked about clearly is a, is a common theme. Let's bring Chris in. Um, so, so Chris, uh, and your internet is dropping in now. So we'll, keep, we'll, we'll keep you until you go, but tell us about your father and, uh, and, and, and his role. I mean, Ted expanded on it earlier, but you know, what was the like in your household? Was it a story that was told all the time or did you find out about it later? It's told never, absolutely never. Um, the, when the movie came out, he watched it. He had massive nightmares for about two weeks. Um, and then he became an absolute, just a fan of an American TV show called Hogan's Heroes. And he used to watch it and laugh and laugh because it was a funny, basically a, a funny show uh, relating to a, a prisoner war camp. Um, he didn't talk about it. Um, when he retired, he um, they moved down to near Niagara Falls, and he did the rubber chicken circuit. He went to the legions and and gave speeches and got a chicken dinner type thing. Um, when he passed away, I was fortunate enough to get his briefcase, which contained a massive amount of stuff uh, related to the um, camp. Uh, which, when I talked to Ted, I gave it to him and said, "Take it." And do what you want with it for your book after he returned it and the book was great but after we returned it um i located the uh, trenton air force base the uh, canadian government air force base and donated it took it all and donated it all to them for their archives and there is a beautiful uh, um, uh, stalag three uh, display of the great escape in the um in the history Oh, we've just we've just lost. Let, the... me, let me pick it up. Let me pick it up there for just yeah, a second sure, while we wait for Chris to come back. He he really raced over that wonderful moment of the handing over the briefcase. You have to know that I mentioned earlier that I knew that the Pengellis were across our back fence, 
and I knew that I had to track Chris down to find him and find whatever connect connection there was. And through uh, some friends on Facebook, we managed to catch up with Chris. And the moment I said I was interested, he said, come on down, because I was, you know, a couple of hours away. We went down and he was then um, owning and, and the, the, the host of a wonderful restaurant in the Prince Edward County area. And we went down, we had a wonderful meal and I was waiting for, waiting for, waiting for this moment when we'd hand it over. He said, I'll give it to you tomorrow. <laughs> so he said, come on back and we'll have the scones and tea in the morning. We got back in the morning. We went to his little apartment above the bistro and he brought out this case and I nearly fainted when I saw how large it was and that inside was all of the contents of this man's life inside Stalag Lift 3. Photographs and schemes and diaries and all of the sketches, the Lee Kenyon sketches, just it was almost like a magical moment where they flew out of the case at me. And then Chris <laughs> managed to put everything into perspective and gave me some sense of his dad's role. The same way Vicky did when she helped me decipher the letters. And when I threw back at her the business of the, the thesauruses, and we both kind of discovered that that was an interesting thread. And then we pieced it together. Um, when Brian and I got connected, um, I mean, obviously it was the story. One of the things to my grave I will remember was what your dad said at the end of the production of the motion picture, Brian, when they were all celebrating your mom, Betty, and your dad, Wally, before they left the shooting of the film in Bavaria, I think it was, they had a commemorative dinner thanking them for being there. And somebody turned to Wally and said, Wally, did we get it right? And your dad turned to whoever that was and said, I don't know if you got it right or not, but the nightmares are coming back. Wow. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, Relier, that was the assistant director. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, that's pretty profound. Um, well, I mean, we've got lots of things I want to talk to you about. I'm all di dive in and out the conversations it goes through. My experience of meeting POWs, and I the, most of the ones I met were Army, captured at, captured at Arnhem, and taken to why the old flag is there. So that's most of my experience. But one of the things uh, that the themes that I got from these guys is the importance of teamwork. And in, in families, for example, one of the, the guys I met, he would say that if you took food onto your plate as a kid, you had to eat it because you didn't have any waste. Because within a prisoner war camp, let's be, talk about Stag of Three, these are mostly aviators. So you're already part of an air crew where your life is dependent on the other person in the air crew. Sometimes it's fighter pilots who are on their own, but certainly bomber crews, you know, there's a there's a bomb aimer, there's a navigator, and each man in that machine is dependent on the other man in that machine. And the same thing carries on within camp because people are going to get bouts of illness, they're going to struggle mentally, they're going to struggle with captivity, they're going to be highs and lows. And in the in the huts, in the in the little friendships there, if you didn't look out of each after each other in the bad times, you wouldn't. Um, get through it together. So has anybody got any stories of that sort of sense of you growing up with some of the values that these men had brought up from the camp? Is that any, any of you kind of ring true there? Anyone want to jump in? Well, I'll tell you a short story. My, my father, um, when we wanted to share something, if my brother had, uh, you know, we had a piece of pie or something and he would just say, look, this is the way we did it in camp. And he would hand one of us the knife and he'd say, one guy cuts and the other guy chooses. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, a lovely story of, related to that, that Chris's uncle, um, Tony Pengelly's brother, David, um, he was uh, slightly younger than Tony, and Tony was a rock star for David. And when, and Chris will, will verify this when he comes back on, but when, when uh, Tony came home, there was a great effort to give Tony whatever, whenever, however they could, whatever he wanted. The first thing he wanted to do was to go to the summer cottage, the family cottage, which was up on a lake up north of Toronto, several hours in an area known as Muskoka. And they, they actually, I think they had an island where the cottage was. And so they went to the island and Tony's mom made everything that Tony loved, roast beef, corn on the cob, apple pie, everything. And um, when he'd finished the first course, uh, Tony did, and of course I'd loved every, every bite of it, um, he turned to his mom and said, 
can I have more? And of course she said, as much as you want. And then when there was some stuff left, a little bit of beef, a little bit of the corn of the cob, whatever, um, he asked her, um, what are you gonna do with that? And she said, oh, it's fine. We'll, you know, we'll, probably if you don't want it, we'll, we'll throw it out. And he was horrified, the notion that she would throw it away. Then after the dinner, he went outside to a tent on the island. It was warm summertime and the evenings were great. So they actually went outside and David and Tony went into the tent, brother to brother. And David, who loved, adored his brother and everything he'd stood for, Air Force, POW, coming home, trying to save his, his, his mates, all spilled out in those nights in the tent where normally there had been no conversation as much as you've described about your relationships, brother to brother. And because David idolized Tony, suddenly the stories spilled out. And I sat for three hours as David told me what the stories were like that Tony told him, not bragging, but real insights as to what life was like, just as you've suggested, Woody, the difficulties, the, the hardships, the rare things. And I swear to God, within a month, David was dead. I had just gone there in time to get the beautiful love affair of one brother for another and the stories that emerged that might not have been saved were it not for David's memory yeah. and that wonderful relationship. Well, I was noticing during your talking there that Cindy was doing a lot of nodding going on there. So I'm going to bring in Cindy now. Does some of this growing up in a family with someone who went through that winter, does some of that ring true with you in terms of just sharing and working together? Um, you, you were certainly nodding away there. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think one of the most poignant moments that I discovered while doing the research on my book was um, finding out that during the long march, as my father, well, first, my father was very lucky that four of his crewmen were all in the same room that he shared at in the West Compound, which I think was kind of unusual. So they were used to being this unit of four. And as the march went on further and further, and they started to kind of drop by the wayside or they'd leave their possessions or whatever. And my father was six foot five, and at this point weighed about 170 pounds. But every time one of his men dropped his pack, my father picked it up and it, at, one point in the march he had his own pack his his navigator's pack and two other packs that he was dragging behind him and after i found his navigator's daughter she wrote to me and said that she had discovered her father's paperwork and so on and mentioned to me that it if it weren't for the fact that my father had carried those things for her father she would have lost all of that history that um, his wartime log that he'd illustrated and written in and everything. My father carried that, but now here it's impacting the next generation, which I thought was, it was a very poignant moment for me to have her say that to me. Um, the other thing that I wanted, you guys have talked about letters and so on. I have the letters that my father sent home, but all the letters that he received, he threw away during the long march. And he described how sad that made him to have to throw that away. But he said, if it wasn't editable, I didn't want to have to carry it. It was too much extra weight. So wow. those were two things. And then lastly, I just wanted to share my father took a heavy papered wrapper off of a Red Cross candy bar and made what he called his captivity calendar, which I was able to find. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he has made the May, June, July, August, September, all the way through to his liberation and each day he crossed off another square on this made up calendar. And to have that piece of history is really um, amazing for me. It's the one thing 
well, not the one thing, but one of the few things that he kept when he kept emptying out his backpack. Um, and I'm wondering, because there's so many men in this group, I'm wondering if my father shared less because he had three daughters and perhaps he felt that sharing it with a son would have been different than sharing it with a daughter. I don't know. Um, we'll never know, but I, I've always wondered if the reason he was well, more closed mouth was because he had three daughters and felt he couldn't share some of the details. Well, well, like Ted, I mean, I've been a historian for a long time and letters home, you have to understand immediately who the letters are written to and what the purpose of the letters was at the time, because they're thinking about their, the loved one they're writing to. So for example, I remember a story very, very briefly, a lady who, whose father landed in Omaha beach in Normandy, and she had grown up believing her dad hadn't done anything anywhere near the front line. He, he arrived like four days after the day, hadn't been anywhere near any bullets or guns. Or anything. And he hadn't, he'd been like two hours in on the morning of D day, right in the front line. It turned out, I'm doing a very short version of the story that her mo mother was a real warrior. I mean, she just worried about everybody all the time. So her dad, when he was in, in the ETO, wrote letters say, oh, yeah, nothing much going on. Yeah, I'm miles away from the front. Yeah. And it meant that the letters had huge value, but you had to understand what you were going to get in them and what you weren't going to get in them because they weren't going to admit to stuff that this guy didn't want to write about. And that's going to be something that Ted would encounter right, reading letters and understand. You have to understand the context because sometimes they're exaggerating things. If they're writing to a mate, they might be exaggerating things. They're showing off or writing to a girlfriend they're trying to impress. Oh, I shot down 17 Germans before I was, you know, th there's all the different ways of interpretation of a letter. But um, Vicky, as the other as the other sole um, girl on the, on the in the group tonight, do you reckon your father treated you differently because you were a girl growing up? Was there things perhaps he didn't want to talk about or did talk about that perhaps that he would have done if wouldn't have done if you'd been a man? What do you think on that, Vicky? Um, I uh, am a lot younger than my two older brothers. So I don't know if, uh, you know, the age or the fact that I am uh, female made any difference. Um, he didn't say much to my older brothers either. Um, the oldest one, he's uh, nine years older than me. He probably knows more uh, or was told more than I was, um, but still a lot of, you know, scant information. Um, my dad, uh, you know, he, as I said, he suffered from PTSD. Um, he had nightmares. Uh, I don't think that he wanted to talk about it. I think he did all his talking when he first came back from the war, um, not to his family, but um, I recall my mom saying that he used to talk about it when they were first uh, together. And, you know, he'd have these people sitting around listening and they're all spellbound and interested to hear what he had to say about it. Um, but I think that went by the wayside. Um, I recall after he had died, uh, one of his colleagues, my dad was a dentist, and uh, <clears throat> they were surprised to hear uh, that he had been, you know, a fighter pilot and had been in the Great Escape. And one of them who went through dental college with him said that he never talked about it. He had no idea. Um, so, no, <laughs> to answer your question, I don't mm -hmm. think it made any difference, um, the fact that I was female. I think that he just didn't talk much about it. He, he talked more about it with his uh, um, other POWs when he, after he retired and moved out to BC. I think he opened up to them a lot, um, which is probably normal, uh, but not to us. And perhaps he thought, you know, because he didn't talk about it, we didn't ask questions and it just probably turned out that he thought we weren't interested. Can I, just jump in, can I jump in for a second, Woody? Sure. Um, just yeah. to amplify what Vicky's saying, and this is a moment that I think she'll agree was, was met, rather distinctive. When Vicky and I connected, because she'd gone to the newspaper with the letters, and I asked if we could get together, she and I worked out a plan 
where I would travel from where I am near Toronto and go down to where she is in Eastern Ontario. And I would join her and her brothers on an island that where one of them lived. And we would sit around uh, the kitchen and I would get a sense with all three of them there, Vicky and her two brothers, what they got from their dad. And I think I'm fairly accurate in this, Vicky. As I went around the table and asked each of Stephen and Stephen and David. Stephen. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I muted. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Glenn. Stephen and and Glenn. Glenn. Sorry. And as I went around the table, one of them would speak and offer a story that he remembered, or that she remembered, or that he remembered. And there was a fascinating moment a couple of times during the round the table discussion when one or the other of them would say gee, I never heard that story. I didn't know that one. And what it's, I sensed was, to a certain extent, going back to um, Cindy's point, maybe Frank chose what he would explain to whom, and not yeah. necessarily the same stories. So it was, in many ways, that interview was as much a discovery for them as it was for me. I mean, my eyes were opened every time, but when I realized that they were learning some things for the first time as we talked, that also was was telling. Yeah. Well, let's talk about PTSD because Vic, Vicky dropped the word in there and we all have a tendency to drop that word in now because we understand, you know, my great uncle was on Saw Beach, my grandfather's was, that, that some of these men were suffering from that. But let's not forget that that label has only been ad adopted in the last couple of decades. When you were young, you guys here, that word hadn't been established. People were... were were returning from the war, not always aware that whatever it was was going in their head was something to that was happening to other people as well in different sorts of ways. So how many of you here, I mean, Vicky's already mentioned it, recognize the fact that now with the benefit of understanding PTSD, your dad was suffering from it. Barry, you're nodding a lot now. Cindy's not. Let's bring in Barry. Well, you're all nodding now. So Barry nodded first. So I'm going to bring Barry in and then we'll bring... So Barry, you know, as you said, we, we, the label of PTSD is a modern invention, reasonably. So what, did your dad know he was not dealing with things perfectly? When did he understand that there were things going on? Did he talk to you about it? What was the, tell us about that. Yeah, he, um, I mean, a lot of it comes from my own schooling and, and knowledge and learning about PTSD and looking back, recognizing the signs. Um, uh, again, I, I was fortunate that my dad was willing to communicate, but I, I also recognize now in hindsight that you could see where the lines were about things that, uh, that uh, he wouldn't talk about, which I learned after the fact. Um, and, and there was a lot of little things. Uh, I mean, there was uh, self-medication to sleep. There was um, just kind of habits and such uh, that, that now, you know, knowing more now, I can actually put a label to, and and sadly, had I known more, we may have been able to support him a little better. But uh, he he definitely, uh, again, in hindsight, because uh, I was uh, quite young at the time, in hindsight, we could have supported him better. But the indications were certainly there, and uh, I mean, it would be impossible to experience these types of things without it having that kind of effect. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I was watching my prep for this week. I watched all my great escape documentaries and gone through my books again. And I forgot, I think it was Jack Lyon, the British veteran who said that even this is him being interviewed in his mid eighties. When he went into a room, he instinctively looked for a second exit. He didn't like being closed in. Um, they, they dealt with it in the war, but some of them had, I think had been probably suppressing claustrophobia and, and the sense of being, and then after war, when they didn't have to suppress it anymore because they were in peacetime, it perhaps exploded more. And, and that sense of, you know, 50, 60 years later, still looking for where their windows are is, is a legacy of what these guys went through. And, and, and I'm not going to in any way say that what we've been experienced with COVID is anything like being in Sagler 3, but we have been quote unquote, quote, imprisoned a bit this last year. It's given us a sense of having to stay at home. Not, I don't write in folks and saying he's comparing, you know, staying at home and not going out. I'm not. I'm just saying there's a slight parallel that gives us a slight inkling. Um, Stuart, you know, we'll bring you in again to the conversation. Um, yeah, PTSD, I, I just, your father. I mean, obviously, you said your father died when you were quite young. Yeah, but... yeah. I mean, he had to, he had a heart, a heart attack when he was 50, 
and uh, and then a fatal heart attack on his 57th birthday. Um, I, I think looking back on it, I think obviously his experiences. He was actually shot down twice. Um, he was shot down in t two Sterlings. The first time was the month before being shot down with Dez, and they were shot down by his own side. <laughs> they were shot down by a hurricane. Um, and thankfully, all, all the crew got out of that particular uh, incident. But um, so I think, as you put, pointed, pointed out earlier, you know, you have to consider that all the men in that camp had either bailed out of aircraft or crash landed. They'd seen friends, seen colleagues die, and, and they were traumatized before they even went in. And then, um, you know, to, to, to suffer the, 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 the ignominy of captivity. But interestingly, I've, I've got my father's letters, which I've written out. And um, there's, there's a really quite telling comment uh, in one of them, which I'll read. This was, um, so it was quite early on, actually. It was the, um, it was the 20th of uh, August, 42. But he said, um, what to me is the most obnoxious is the waste of valuable time. Life is short enough without spending years in such places as these. However, I'm exceedingly lucky to be able to look forward to after the war at all, in inverted commas. So I think you can always you know, realise that he was very lucky to, uh, to, to have bailed out a, a burning aircraft twice and survived. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think it was traumatic for him. And also in terms of, um, one thing I do remember, he, he, his diet, he, he, he could, we, we re rarely went out for meals because he, he just couldn't, he only could really deal with home cooked food eating out seemed to unsettle his stomach. So I don't know whether that was down to, you know, three years of uh, uh, a pre-OW diet. So I think that had an effect on him. So, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I think undoubtedly, he, he didn't talk about it much from what I remember, but yeah, maybe we could have supported him more. I don't know, my, my mum says he, he didn't talk much. One, a, funnily enough, a neighbor of his was a, a doctor and uh, one day he took my dad aside apparently and said, Alan, I think you need to talk about some of this stuff. You know, you, you, need, to, you need to get in it. But yeah, unfortunately he's not party to that conversation. One interesting, one, one more lighthearted uh, comment though. In his uh, diary, uh, in his, um, you know, the, the, um, the log, the wartime log given to them by the Red Cross, there's a whole list of pubs um, there were obviously recommendations from all the people that he'd met in camp. So there's a, all these pubs that he must visit after the war, <laughs> <laughs> restaurants and pubs. So that's quite, so I suppose that's quite uh, uh, relevant to it, to our, our situation now. There are all the pubs that we want to yeah. go back. But uh, there's a whole, and I, one, of, one of these days I'd like to try and go through all these pubs and go and, go and visit them all if they're still there. I imagine some, most of them are. So that was uh, that was quite interesting. So uh, well, that's yeah. a very simple concept, there, is it? Because uh, you know, you imagine it in a hut, and you 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 can find there's lots of people in a very small space. People have different ways with dealing with just the normality. So some people, I'm imagining would love to fantasize about what they're missing out on. Oh my God, if I was in a pub now, I'd have a huge, mm. great roast dinner with Yorkshire puddings. And other people would hate the mention of food because they that's the last thing I want to talk about. Some will be talking about their girlfriends. Others will be, stop talking about your girlfriends. I've, <laughs> and I wonder just how those, those things would kind of gel because we're Most not all the same. Human beings are not the same. Does anyone kind of know any sort of experience of just how they just got on with each other? Because it is a long, long time to be with, with locked up with other people with all these elements of guilt and, and, and trauma. And some of them have got injuries from the crashes. Some of them have seen their friends burned to death or been captured, uh, whatever. Uh, you know, just the day-to-day -day life. Did, 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 did your family members have a particular way they, they survived by either not thinking about home or thinking about home a lot? Any, anyone want to jump in on that one? Well, uh, I'll talk. Ryan, Ryan. Um, my father, lots of them talked about food. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where you don't get much food. And um, a, a few times in my life traveling, that was the case. But uh, he had pages and pages in the back of his war log about restaurants to visit in <laughs> London and how to make certain things. And um, the, the only part of his war log that really survived, a lot of it went to the production of the movie, um, but uh, is the start, the long march stuff. And he was with Kingsley Brown and George Harsh. And yeah. they talked about uh, 
food all the time. <laughs> you know, uh, now he was. He didn't seem obsessed with it when he got home, but boy, he sure was obsessed with it then. Yeah. So, and Cindy, yep. Uh, yeah, my my father, I don't know where his logbook is. I don't have it, but I do have the, the blue books that the Red Cross gave them, like the old exam books. And in that, he and his roommates wrote down uh, pages and pages of the first thing that they'd like to do when they got home, what they would eat, what what big band they wanted to hear, all that kind of stuff. And they had also pages of recipes that, you know, mom's meatloaf or whatever. That And those were the kinds of things that they, they talked about all the time. Dad uh, mentioned that aside from trying to keep warm and making meals, they would play a lot of bridge. They... Um, I don't know where, I guess the Red Cross gave them cards. I don't know. Somebody made a cribbage set and they played cribbage. And um, my father talked about home, according to what I found, all the time because his uh, crewmates would uh, joke to him about how he'd lie in the top bunk at night and say, oh, here I am back in Aurora looking at the sunset and this and that. And they, and that was the way he got through it. Um, as far as the PTSD goes, I don't think that he necessarily recognized that he had it. Um, but his um, co-workers and his boss did. And and his parents' way of dealing with that was to let him work it out between God and himself. And uh, when his employer realized that he was, as my father put it, off course... They stepped in to help him, um, and I think that was probably a turning point for him. Um, but what I didn't know until later in life were the medical things that I forget who it was. Brian maybe mentioned the stomach issues that his father had, and my father had irritable bowel syndrome. He had um, suffered frostbite during the long march and later in his life, he had to have his toenails all removed because of fungus that he'd picked up in the camp that he just couldn't get rid of. And dad entered the service with a history of debilitating pneumonia, which was, and several times, once in England and once in uh, Stalag Luft three and once in Mooseburg, he was very, very sick with pneumonia, which l went on through his life and was ultimately what what killed him but he just didn't have the his the strength to fight it anymore and i'm really surprised that he was able to fly at the heights that they did with the history of pneumonia but he managed to do it um a little aside note about my father is that he went into the air force because his baby brother had been killed um in a training accident and he wanted to carry on for his brother. So when he was shot down and my grandparents got a second letter saying, we, you know, the first one saying your son's been killed. This one saying, we don't know where he is and wondering and wondering about their second son. I just, I, I had a great deal of admiration for my father's parents and his uh, remaining siblings who held it all together in such an unknown time. And um, for dad to feel the need to carry on for his brother, Ben, was, I'm sure there are lots of stories like that in World War II, but that was, that was his motivation. He was in the cavalry and he said, mm -hmm. This is not for me. I need to be doing something for Ben. And mm -hmm. that was his lead into the Air Force. I mean, what's coming up? I've just I'm gonna um show the photo the, the poster of the movie from Ted's PowerPoint. Um because when you've been talking, you you guys here, I can't help but thinking of the tagline of the poster, the great adventure, the great entertainment. And I think it's worth referencing that again because a lot of people who are 
reading this week in various newspapers and seeing and document there'll be references to 77 years ago today or this week uh, the great escape of curve and stagger of three and there's that the, the movie comes to everyone's mind with the motorbike and the aircraft and okay they do cover the death of the 50 but there is this sense of adventure and what i'm getting from you people tonight correctly is that there's as we said at the top of the show there's this long story of that both the existence in the prisoner war camp at the time and hunger and cold and difficulty and then there's this legacy post-war that they carried with them physically and mentally for having been interned in some cases for four or five years in some cases even for just six months or a few months but whatever length of time you're in captivity the scars you bore mental and physical stay with you forever and i think that's very important what we're doing tonight to acknowledge that, that, that there's a longer story here so with that in mind given that we are i've chosen great escape week 77 years on time i think for anyone to jump in on what you believe the legacy of that escape is 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 the, does the escape overshadow POW lamp? Are you proud to be associated with it? Are there any conflictions in your mind when you think about that? Do you enjoy the movie? Any of those kind of subjects, anyone wants to address that, that, that's kind of where I want to go now is what you think all this time on is, is the enduring interest fascinating. Barry's been nodding a lot on this one. I'll bring you all in one at a time. But Barry is the chief nodder now. So Barry, you know, we're 77 years on. What's the... What what does the story hold to you? Have your opinions changed over the years? What what's what's the legacy of the Great Escape? Um, well, they've they've certainly evolved. My opinions have evolved, and as more information comes out. But I think I think what the Great Escape brings to us, and, and what all of our family members have helped us to acknowledge and recognize and build out, is the fact that I mean there were thousands of prisoners of war. Um, there were thousands like my father that were in for over four and a half years, almost five years in, a, in prison camps. And I think uh, if you encapsulate the, or, or use the, the term hope uh, and, and perseverance and look at the great escape as an example, because it's one incident. I mean, my dad talked more about the force march than he did about the great escape, uh, unless media was asking um, that, that what this brings together and when you look at who who we are and who's on the screen here and our families and having grown up around uh, uh you know families and and other pow's it it i think it teaches it teaches and instills the hope still in in future uh, especially at this time that we're going through with covid um that we can as humans overcome and that it it takes strength, it takes your neighbor, it takes the person beside you, it takes that kind of connectivity and bonding um, for us as humans to take that step forward. So I think The Great Escape is a bit of a, I wanna say a, a marketing push because my dad, the few times that we had the movie on, all my dad did was scream at the TV. Um, uh, although that being said, and I think Ted remembers this, I do, I used to drive my father to the POW lunches and the air crew lunches in the later years. And he did a local interview in Calgary. And um, I'm, I'm going to build a bit of a defense for him that it was a weak moment. But when he was asked, you know, what life was like inside the camp, he made the comment, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but basically that most of the time it was like being in a summer camp. And, uh, and I recall that the next day we had a POW lunch and um, I mean, these are pretty strong men that uh, had all watched that interview. And uh, my dad was educated as to terminology around that. But it, overall, I mean, these are people that, that understood, understood what was necessary to survive just beyond themselves. And, uh, and I mean, I think, again, I just wrap back to the fact that The Great Escape, uh, as, as Hollywood as it may have become, gives us an example and something to pin to in these challenging times of of hope and what people can do when they come together yeah and, and let's face it the movie's not perfect but we all kind of enjoy it and where would we be with our understanding of creaky life without that movie that's the thing it's like semi bright ryan and band of brothers and lawrence arabia um, and I've done some shows on world war ii tv recently where we've talked about the influence of video games and board games we've talked about 
World War II comics growing up, anything that brings an audience to the understanding of the past is important. And some people just watch the movie and can't wait for Steve McQueen to put his, you know, get, get on his bike, in his chinos, his leather jacket, and, and race off as Whitson. But other people will go out and they'll buy Ted Barris's book or Guy Walter's book or Jonathan Vance's book or they'll go online or they'll join a Facebook group and they'll look into what these people went through. And the thing is, a staggering number of people were interred in World War II. And at one end of the interment story, you have concentration camps and internment camps and the other end you have allied prisoners of war and of course you have german prisoners of war going to canada going to the usa who became part of citizens of your country's post-war in britain we had i mean my, the first guy who cut my hair when i was a kid was a former um german pow and so we've pow camps were, and, and pow life was an integral part of world war ii and if Great Escape is the one way people find access to that, then so be it. But anyone else wants to jump in on this idea of the legacy, what you feel about? I mean, Brian, because you of yeah. all the people here, your you your family had the most connection with the movie. So it's all kind of your dad's fault, Brian. So what's your feeling about it, right? Yeah, looking well, back 70, 70 years I on. certainly think that um one of the things that uh, always struck me about the ex-prisoner of war uh, were the, the camaraderie. They were close. They were all friends and they stayed friends their whole life. I knew Scruffy Weir from the time I was a kid till his death, you know? Um, so the movie was coalesced that more, especially for people that weren't prisoner of war. Uh, and I think even though my father knew there was lots of license taken, especially after the escape, um, uh, he, he thought that this was going to make um, people aware of the great escape much more than they ever would have been. And I think that's really what happened. Um, certainly most people remember it because of the movie. And if there had been no movie, I think it would just have been one of a many, many, many heroic incidents that happened in the war um, that uh, aren't as memorable. So as much as we uh, uh, poo poo the, the Hollywood um, unreality of it. Um, they did a, a lot of work in the first part of the movie to make it authentic. Of course, mm -hmm. it was brought down in scale because they had to show that the people were composite characters. Um, and then they went wild after the escape, you know, with people stealing planes and motorcycles and boats. And um, But, you know, Sturgis knew what he was about and it was a dramatic movie and uh, um, he made it that way and it made it a hit. And I think it a lot, a lot more people know about the Great Escape because of the movie than really just the history. My yeah. dad often said that uh, if if, uh, if they had done it as a documentary, it'd be so boring nobody would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that that is the thing. I mean, I, I didn't come up with Jonathan Vance, but actually the preparation for the escape because of the limited materials they had. I mean, Ted did a fantastic presentation, but he, but he was bottling two years of work into an hour of excitement. You know, there's a lot of just sitting there carving for like 14 hours in a way that you can't kind of stretch that out. You couldn't have a movie of an, of, a, of you know, two hours of people just, you know, carving and it would be boring. So they had to kind of cut to the chase, no pun intended, and 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 bring it exciting. But Ted, as as the historian on the panel here, you know, you've written about numerous subjects. Um, what's your feeling about the Great Escape within Canada, particularly because obviously you're a Canadian journalist historian. It, it's it's an important part of the Canadian story. Um, the Great Escape. Where do you think its legacy? What's important about its legacy? Seventy seven years on. Well, I agree completely with with um, uh, Brian's assessment that, and 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 Barry's as well. That were it not for the movie, none of the groundswell and and the immediate recognition factor that saying the Great Escape creates would have happened. I mean, I, I think <laughs> your comment, Barry, is is apt that the documentary would put us all to sleep. Perhaps um, that makes it gives me pause because there's a group now preparing a doc documentary based on my book. <laughs> And I'm a little worried about it. I hope they do a good job. But I think one of the points I would make uh, um, is something that George Sweener told me. George is the man who was the duty pilot and just passed away at 101. And it might help to tie some of what I've been hearing from each of you this evening or this afternoon. George said to me after many days of, of interview, uh, and, and his wife, Joan, was there. And of course, they met in January 43, mar or earlier, married in January. He was shot down two months later. And, and he found out uh, that she was pregnant and 
never saw his daughter till he got home several years later. But George said to me something that, that sticks. And he said, Stalag Love 3 and the experience of being a POW was my university experience. What I learned about humankind, what I learned about hatred, what I learned about innovation, what I learned about kindness, what I learned about um, myself. Uh, remember early on, I mentioned the business of the trees being an additional fence wall between mm -hmm. them and the rest of the world, not going wire crazy. For him, and, and quite literally, as you pointed out, Woody, some of the men were getting an education. He was getting books sent to him from the University of Saskatchewan so that he could study engineering while he was in the camp. So literally, it was his university. Um, emotionally, it was his university. Figuratively, it was his university. And I guess his graduation was surviving. Yeah. Well, that's been the, I mean, again, I'm not, not going to be uh, bringing COVID too much, but that's been the COVID experience, is it? Do you let these 12 months beat you or do you come out of it better i don't mean this the tragedy of people who are, who are losing relatives to, to succumbing to the disease but you know the confinement people are some people are just sitting in their sweatpants watching tv other each day some people are giving themselves education and writing books it's uh, as cindy has been saying herself earlier how do you deal with these these the, the 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 shitty things life throws at you how do you respond to it and one thing that we've learned from POWs is that generally they found a way of working together to 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 endure that they worked on projects and and i know later on in the week i hope some of you will watch the other programming we do guy walters who i know very well his book the real great escape looked at some of the facts and figures about the negative side of it in the in the big operation the germans took after escape over the course of the next few weeks eight thousand different hiding uh, uh workers who were hiding from the germans other people were kind of rounded up and caught up there's a suggestion that maybe they'd have been better off not getting out of the camp at all i mean it's just an argument and we can agree with it or disagree with it the point is is that we're focusing today on those thousands of men inside the camp and their priority is their own mental health their own um uh way of dealing with this adversity and that and that's why i think this program is an important one we're doing because it's what these individuals went through and they weren't looking at the big picture they didn't know what was going to happen to the 50 who were, who were murdered they didn't know what was happening outside they were thinking about what they could do to deal with this captivity so does anyone else want to jump in on the legacy side of things stuart or vicky i mean stuart we'll bring in you again i have, I have to say goodbye here i'm sorry to say okay, no problem um stuart nice to see you again Ted, yeah, cheers. Here. and cheers. uh nice me, Thank you. i'm happy to do it i weirdly enough have a webinar on the great escape to do in 45 minutes so okay no problem well you're popular man today <laughs> well we'll wrap things up fairly soon but thank you for joining us brian it's been a privilege listening to you talk and, and, and chris unfortunately his internet connection was going so in he's he's left now and but um uh thank you for joining us brian and hopefully we'll meet yeah. again on some other, some have other to have to run. sometime yeah thanks brian thanks brian thank you so Stuart, you know, we'll bring in you, and then we'll, we'll we'll round things up. What you're know, the legacy, you know, when you know, as a son of someone who's involved in the camp there, where what's your feelings, seventy seven years on? Well, first of all, I'd, my dad, um, he also had, he eventually qualified as a pharmacist. We had a had a family business, a, a small chain of pharmacy shops in Coventry, where my father's from, or where I'm from. Um, Incidentally, my dad actually um, was only 20 the night his city was badly bombed uh, in 1940. And he, he, in the letter he wrote back to his parents when he was doing his basic training away from the city, um, there's this notion of wanting to do to, to get back, uh, to, to fight back. Um, but in terms of his uh, university experience, he similarly had some books sent out and was able to continue some of his pharmacy studies which were interrupted by uh, the war but in terms of legacy i think um, especially in the strange times that we live now not just the covid but i think the uncertain political environment that we live in at the moment um there's i don't know it, it seems to be more nationalism than ever before uh, what strikes me about the, the Great Escape is the fact that it, that spirit of cooperation and that it transcend, transcended uh, a, a number of uh, 13 nationalities uh, represented amongst the escapists. Like so, 
yeah so out. the teamwork across 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 borders you know across nationalities across cultures and, and to get this job done to to to, to fulfill this this uh this um escape would i think is a is a lesson um for us at the moment you know we need to work together um you know with what's going on with vaccines and things at the moment yeah, yeah you know it, we need to be working together and it, uh, so i think that, that to me is the the, the biggest legacy uh, absolutely that's, that's a really good point cooperation. yeah really yeah. good point and um people may not know but According to some historians, the first ever recorded use of a reference to a League of Nations or a United Nations was in Eisenhower's pre-D Day to the troops when he talked about a United Nations. And I think, you know, when you're reading the Great Escape books of, of the different ones, Ted's and Guy's and Jonathan's and all the others, you know, the, the, the nationalities, the, the, let's look at the names on the monument. They represent pretty much every corner of the world. Um, people came from Australia, New Zealand, and the Czech Republic, and, and and all over. And that spirit of putting aside the differences that have grown up with different religions, different values, they're from different classes, uh, different ages, different sensibilities, different ambitions, and yet they all had to work in a in an environment where the collective enemy was captivity. Not necessarily the Germans captivity first, the Germans second, and and all that togetherness is that your right to it is an absolutely vital um, thing to talk about today. Um, we will wind things down if you miss. Vicky, uh, any any remarks about the legacy, what you think, where we are 77 years on? I'd just be repeating what everyone else has said. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm sure you're proud that you've got this family connection and and it's that that's extraordinary. I, I, I'm, the people comments on YouTube, people are have been really pleased that you you family members have come on and shared this stuff with you. And I said, we weren't trying to do the heavy lifting tonight. We're not trying to explain the history of the escape and the camp. We're just getting a few personal recollections of some of the wider story. And I think it was important that we covered the march. It was important we'd covered the fact that some men went to that camp after the escape. Some had left the camp before that. As Ted said today, a lot, a lot of the Americans who've been working on the initial preparations were moved to other compounds. So there's this whole extended story. And those as I say, those that were in the camp but did not want to be actively part of the escape but were still friends of and part of the general experience of having to endure captivity. But um, anyone got anything else they'd like to say? This is a you know, platform now to, to say to each other or to say to me or anything, any kind of words of wisdom you've got from your fathers that you'd like to give us? Uh, I just want to re restate uh, what Brian had said too, that that truly at this time when we're desperately looking for uh, leaders in all pieces of our life, um, that uh, I hope that certainly for us, and, and I wanna thank both you and Ted for bringing this out, that it gives us an opportunity to show, <laughs> I hate using the term following generations, makes me feel old, but uh, just to show the world that, that humans can do this and we have done it, and somehow we need to get over some of the crap that's going on now and the divisiveness, but. Thank you for putting this together. Well, no, that was the Ted, Ted, Ted's idea for this one, and then and then I reached out to Stuart, and, and Cindy came because of that, and um, yeah, Chris had to drop out because of internet, and Brian's got to go to be a to be a celebrity elsewhere. But you know, that the, the thing is, there might be some more people now who happen to find this on YouTube who didn't know there were family members they could get in touch with. Who knows what email Ted might get tomorrow? Or I might get saying, "Can you put me in touch with these people?" Because my dad, my great uncle, and this understanding of the past is important, and. It's Can I just add okay. something there, Woody? Yeah, sure, Ted. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I, but you, you've what we've all been sort of dancing around here to a certain extent, and I think maybe needs to be stated more obviously is that because so many of the veterans of the Second World War are disappearing so quickly that the voices, the first-hand witness uh, stories that come from their voices, their hearts, their memories, are fast disappearing. History's telling now depends on the people who are in this program and the people who like them have an attic full of grandpas or dads or grandmas, moms, memorabilia from the war, which they think is worthless because no one's come looking to sort through it and write a book about it. We don't know about it. Were it not for the families, were it not for um, Barry's dad's log, were it not for Vicky's dad's letters, were it not for that suitcase that uh, Chris gave me, um, were it not for families 
sensing that this has value, not in terms of dollars, because there are too many people running around grabbing this stuff and keeping it, buying it, saying, look, I've got, you know, so-and-so suitcase from The Great Escape. No, 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 no. This is public. This is for us to learn about what we these people went through, to share among ourselves and pass along to generations who won't know the firsthand witnesses of the Second World War like we have from our dads and grandparents. What you're seeing here with the families having saved all this means that they have saved history for a generation. Yeah. And to, to add, and that's perfectly stated, and to add to that as well, I think we generally have a bit of an obsession these days with the veterans who did the extreme end of stuff. I mean, the commandos, the paratroopers, the fighter pilots. And we often, in our celebration of those men and women, we forget the people at the other end of the scale, the ground crews, the people who built roads, the people who were in camps who didn't escape, the people who had to endure stuff who weren't at the exciting end. I think, personally, that's where a lot of this this fake veteran comes from is this sense that we only pay attention to the ones who did the really exciting stuff. And of course, Brian's going on because his dad was involved in the movie. So therefore he's at the, let's say top of the tree in terms of fame, but why on earth couldn't I've had a panel of people who had still of three members whose fathers and grandfathers were not involved in the escape at all. Their voices would have been just as wide and just as interesting as those who were. And of, of course we have family members whose fathers were actively involved in escape, they are all part of history. And we collectively have to get away from this idea of only focusing on exciting ones. I have been in Normandy when I've been with, with, with people, a veteran telling their story, and the public have been hanging off this veteran's story, and then a more exciting veteran comes across. Perhaps he's been in a paratrooper, and they will just drop that one and leap off it because they are further up the food chain. And that is thoroughly annoying to see that happen to me. I've known... British airborne veterans say they were at Pegasus Bridge because that's the only bit of the battle people have ever heard of, even though they were five miles away fighting somewhere else. And that is a dangerous precedent I think we need to avoid. Everybody's story is valuable. The kids collecting waste paper in Milwaukee were part of the war effort just as much as the guys firing an AB-24 across Northwest Europe. All of the stories are valid. All of the descendants of people who had any part of the war are valid, and we need to celebrate all of it. That's my kind of soapbox statement on that. Um, and it's very important to me. So, well, I think we've got to the point where we're going to end up repeating things. So it's been fantastic having you on tonight. I'm I'm really proud of the fact this little this little interview will sit on YouTube and be a resource that people can look at and it you know and 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 see what you you family members have had to say about your 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 relatives. It's been extraordinary to talk to. So, um, to Chris who's already left us, to Brian who's already left you. Thank you very much to Barry, to Vicky, to Cindy, to Ted, to Stuart, and particularly to Ted for setting this all up. I've I've had a whale of a time listening to your stories and. I think the takeaways are the PTSD, the suffering, the cold, and the, the escape is part of the story, but it's part of the story. So on that note, I will um, say thank you to everybody watching. Uh, tomorrow's show is an early one because Louise Williams is joining us from Australia. So that's um, uh, 9 a.m. UK time to talk about her uh, uncle, who was John Williams, one of the uh, the carpenters. And then we continue with other shows through the week. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. This is Paul Woodadge for um, uh, World War II TV in Great Escape Week. I hope you join me for the other shows later this week. And to all our guests, thank you very much for joining us. You can continue the conversations on Twitter and Facebook. Don't forget to read the descriptions below in YouTube where you can contact how to get Ted's book, how to get in touch with me, how to get in touch with Ted. There are Facebook groups about Stagliff 3. There are Facebook groups about The Great Escape. You can find about all of this stuff online. This is Paul Woodadge. For World War II TV saying thank you for everybody for watching. I'll see you all again very shortly. Thank you.